Appreciate it. Россия на деле доказала, что способна защитить своих соотече соотечественников. С честью отстаивать правду и справедливость. Russia has extraordinary influence over these separatists. No one denies that. Vladimir Putin is literally getting away with murder. Наши партнеры в каком бы состоянии ни находились их государства и какой бы внешнеполитической концепции они ни придерживались, должны понимать, что с нами лучше не связываться. Today it is America that stands strong and united with our allies, while Russia is isolated with its economy in tatters. I know this uh, is embargoed information, but I believe that there was a Russian attack on the Pentagon's computer systems recently. I have a few questions about that. A, is that true? Uh, B, what was the nature of the attack and how do we know it's coming from Russia? It is true. It did originate in Russia. Mm. Uh, all of its motivations are not clear. They did get it to a DOD network for a brief time, were detected, expelled. Do we know why? No, I don't think we know entirely why, but you know, this can't be good, right? right? For anybody to be inside of our networks, whatever right. their motivation, or to be inside of the of, uh, networks of some of our critical infrastructure protection. So in this case, we did what we're supposed to do, which is find out and uh, take remedial uh, action, but it's kind of an indication of the world in which we live. Earlier this year, the sensors that guard DOD's unclassified networks detected Russian hackers accessing one of our networks. They discovered an old vulnerability in one of our legacy networks that hadn't been patched. While it's worrisome they achieved some authorized access to our unclassified network, we quickly identified the compromise and had a team of incident responders hunting down the intruders within 24 hours. After learning valuable information about their tactics, we analyzed their network activity associated with Russia and then quickly kicked them off the network. We have Iran, we have Iraq, we have ISIS, we have Russia, we have all these problems. Where do you rank cybersecurity in that list? Well, it's pretty high up there because it, it, it affects them all. It cuts through all of them. At the level of actual warfare, all of our weapon systems, our ships, our planes, our tanks, they depend upon networks to function. Right. So there's no point in spending all that money on them yes. if you don't have secure networks. When it comes to terrorism, obviously terrorists use networks. They use networks to communicate among themselves. They use networks to advertise themselves. And we use the networks to combat them, detect sure. them. So all over the whole spectrum, from traditional state to state conflict down to these shadow wars that we have in today's world. Cyber pervades all that, and we've, we've got to be good at it if we're gonna protect people across that whole spectrum. Now, I know you've spoken in the past, uh, you're very passionate about disarming nuclear arsenals. We just got back from Russia where we talked to Rogozin, who's in charge of the military. He's uh, threatened a nuclear surprise. Uh, we talked to Foreign Minister Lavrov. We talked to Peskov, the voice of Putin. We see a tremendous rise in, let's say, Cold War rhetoric or Cold War 2.0 rhetoric, war games, and now overt cyber action. How dangerous is this escalation between Russia and America? And where do you see it going? Well, I did begin my life during the Cold War, as many of us did, and this is a throwback to conduct activities that intimidate allies, 
of the United States to rattle nuclear sabers that have been rattled in a quarter century. Sure. You know, this by a country that's got plenty of problems to solve economically and plenty, plenty of opportunities if they want to turn the corner right. and not go backwards, but go forward. That's the Russia that we wanted. That's the Russia that we hoped would emerge 10 and 15 years ago. And I hope that's a Russia that can be recreated. But right now they're walking backwards and that's obviously not good for us, but it's not gonna be good for them either. And they still have the second large or the first largest arsenal. They have a very large nuclear arsenal and they're one of a handful of countries that do. Obviously that's a very dangerous thing, but those aren't gonna buy prosperity for their people. They're not going to buy progress. They're not going to buy what, what people want in life. They're not going to get them with nuclear weapons. And that's as true as it was back in the Cold War. Iran has unprecedented power in Iraq now through militias, through control of some politicians and security forces because of ISIS, because we're using the Shiite militias to fight ISIS. How do we fight ISIS? Are we winning? And what is Iran's role in that fight? First of all, the key to the defeat of ISIL is that once defeated, they stay defeated. Sure. Because that's the case with terrorists who take territory all the time. And what that means is that in the end, the only real defeat is one in which the people on the ground take back their lives, take back their territory. That means that has to be the Iraqi people. Our approach is to try to, if we can, recreate a multi-sectarian approach by the government of Baghdad, which the previous government eroded to the defeat of ISIL. Now, That'll require, as you indicate, that anybody who's fighting ISIL be under the control of the Iraqi government in Baghdad, and not off on their own, let alone under control of a foreign power. And so we have made our assistance to the fight, which is from the air, conditional upon the Iraqi government approaching this in the only way that's going to work in the long run, which right. is a multi-sectarian way. Those Shiite forces that are under the command and control of the Iraqi government in Baghdad, we support. Those that are off doing their own thing or doing someone else's thing, we don't support. We've made that very clear, but it's, it's more than just a convenience. It's the only way to get lasting defeat of ISIL. We were embedded with ISIS last summer, and one of the things they told us was one of their biggest successes in recruiting was from airstrikes. Now they might just be saying that. However, I wanted to know your point of view on that, the use of airstrikes, but also what do you attribute the popularity of ISIL or ISIS to? Because one of the questions I have is how could they have risen so fast, 50,000, 60,000 fighters, 30,000 foreign fighters, how did they get so popular so quickly? Well, in Iraq specifically, yeah. and in parts of Syria, they got popular because the government that was there was not popular, right. because it wasn't regarded that, specifically the government of Iraq at the time, wasn't protecting them. Its uh, security forces were oppressing them, not protecting them. And so the people were, looked, were looking for an alternative and it being a multi-sectarian country, it's easy for that kind of environment to lead to sectarian violence. So that's what caused ISIL to be welcomed in there. Now, you can well imagine that many people in those regions have come to regret that decision or at least welcome an alternative. And that's the alternative that the Baghdad government needs to present to them. You could have a better life. You don't have to be subject to the barbarism of ISIL. So that's the appeal in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, if you go elsewhere around the world to people who are recruited online sure. and so forth, that's usually a matter, as far as one can tell, of people who are 
looking for meaning in, a, in their lives right. are desperate in some way. I mean, what, why else would people be attracted to violence of that sort of barbaric kind? Will you be tasked with delivering on Obama's promise to close Gitmo? I would really like to close Gitmo. Right. For the simple reason that I think it is a rallying point for jihadi propaganda. Right. And I would just as soon not have it there. However, it's easier said than done. Sure. Because it has to be done in a way that's consistent with the law, and it has to be done in a way that's consistent with the fact that there are people in Gitmo whom it is not safe to have any other disposition for than behind bars. Right. So that's the hard part. I'm for the objective, and I think it's a matter of not whether it's a good thing to do, but when and how. You've got a tough job, a very tough job. One of those lasting legacies of your job, or I know you're new, but one of the folders that you got put on your desk is Afghanistan. You bet. This year, sadly, there's more civilian deaths, police deaths, I believe Afghan army deaths since the, the beginning of the conflict. How do we leave without Afghanistan reverting? That is the central question of the strategy in Afghanistan. The strategy has been to build up the Afghan security forces so that they can safeguard the country and protect the people and keep the Taliban at bay and keep radicals at bay. We've worked very hard over the last decade to build up that security force. They're doing pretty well. You know, I've been at this now for several years, and if you'd asked me a few years ago, did I think the Afghan security forces would be as good as they've proven to be, I would have said, well, I'm not sure. We're trying to get them there, but I'm not sure that they are. They're doing awfully well. Now, that doesn't mean it's over yet. As you, you use the expression leaving, and I just want to say that we intend to stay, not in the combat numbers, but in the numbers to continue to help the Afghan security forces get better and better, because right. that's the ticket to right. the future. That's the key. And that'll be the measure of the success of our campaign in Afghanistan. I'm not going to tell you it's 100% chances sure. that it'll work out that way, but so far, so good. We need to stick with it. You know, we've done a lot in Afghanistan, shot a lot there. I've been there a lot personally. And I think that the fear is that if America, with the best troops in the world, the best technology in the world, couldn't effectively quash the Taliban, then how is the ANA going to do that? And also that they're, much like Iraq, there are sectarian political and religious lines that are going back to pre-invasion. And people there are very worried that the Taliban you know, are, are having a resurgence in, in certain provinces, in Helmand, for example. Well, it's, it's not surprising that we can't provide lasting sure. security in, in another people's society. They have yeah. to do that. We try to give them the opportunity for that, help them create the climate in which that's possible. But for the defeat of extremism to last, for it to stick, it can't be Americans that do that. It has to be the people who, who live there so we can help them. And that's what we're trying to do in all those places. And, and is this the end of our sort of nation building? Go in, get the dictator out and try to nation build? Well, I think there will, there will be circumstances in the future where we assist countries that are struggling to protect their own people. Right. But I think by far and away, not only the American preferred way of doing things, but the effective way to have lasting effects is to help people control their own societies, conduct themselves in a decent way so that their people want to live under that government. And when there's a breakdown to get back to a situation where they're able to take care of their own people, we can assist, we can help open the door, and I, I think the United States will always be prepared to do that, but we can't do it our alone. That's, I think, the key distinction. The greatest fear that I have regarding the outcome 
uh, for America of these disclosures is that nothing will change. Mr. Snowden has been accused of leaking classified information and he faces felony charges here in the United States. What's your view of him and his motives? Edward Snowden is a hero. A patriot would not run away and look for refuge in Russia or Cuba or some other country. A patriot would stand up in the United States and make his case to the American people. Through successes and strains, our ties have broadly endured. But I believe we must renew the bonds of trust and rebuild the bridge between the Pentagon and Silicon Valley. Now you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you're a nuclear physicist. Elementary particle physics. Okay, elementary particle. Fine distinction. Right. So you're a scientist. You're also, you know, now Secretary of Defense. Under the DOD, you run also the NSA. Do you have a job to do to fix the bridges with Silicon Valley after the NSA surveillance problem? Yes, we definitely do. And that's a good way of putting it, build bridges, because the Snowden disclosures put people in a bad position. And I think we need to emphasize a couple of things about how we try to conduct ourselves. Right. Uh, one is we try to do only things that are lawful and appropriate. Second, our whole purpose is to protect people and facilitate internet commerce, as by the way, the Defense Department does for many decades. And the Snowden revelations, there's no question about it, created a barrier of suspicion. And President Obama says, don't worry, it's only metadata. He's really saying, don't worry, you're all just under surveillance. I think most Americans would agree that for defense or security, you know, some lawful surveillance is fine. But in some cases, it sort of went beyond that. You know, one of the definitions of a police state is having the police watching you at all times, knowing what you're doing at all times. Do you worry about that? Well, sure. That's why we have to do this very carefully. We need to behave in such a way, but also be understood to behave in such a way that we're not trying to get into anybody's business or their thoughts. We're trying to protect people against terrorists, against intellectual property thieves, and you can't just say that, you have to prove that. And that means we have to operate under laws. We can't tell people everything we're doing and still protect them. That's why we have a Congress. That's why we have laws and courts and so forth so that they can check on us. And believe me, we tell them everything we're doing. It's very, very difficult, I think, uh, to have a transparent debate about secret programs approved by a secret court issuing secret court orders based on secret interpretations of the law. I know that this is the first time in 20 years that a sitting Secretary of Defense has visited Silicon Valley. Why now? Well, because it's one of the hubs of American innovation and because the institution I'm responsible for, the Department of Defense, we need to stay the best in the world. The only way to do that, just like any business that wants to be cutting edge, if we're gonna be cutting edge, we have to be open to change and we have to be open to the rest of the world. I would like to continue to attract the very best to the US military and to the Department of Defense mission. We want to be an environment where kids who are innovative and really smart want to be. Even if they don't spend their whole life there, just spend a couple of years with us. We'll get something out of it. They'll get something out of it. Mutual benefit. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for being with us.